All right, everybody, welcome back. It's a brand new episode of KPS Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Steve. And I'm your co-host, Kayla. We're here to pick up where we left off on the last episode and dive a little more into the demon phenomenon. I want to talk to you all tonight about the stages of demonic haunting. Because what you know we found in the course of years of investigating these phenomena, and by that I mean reading books about these phenomena, is that they seem to follow a recognizable pattern. And it never really happens randomly. So, I want to talk about the four common stages of demonic haunting that culminates in possession, which is really the only one you ever get in a movie or ever talk about. The others aren't scary enough, I guess. And maybe I'll talk about how you can avoid some of these things. I'll talk about that right now. The best way to avoid any kind of this stuff is just to not get into it in the first place. So if you're afraid of getting possessed, maybe it's time to turn off this episode and go do something else. Or rather, just study it and not delve into objects and locations. That's exactly right. Another way to avoid demonic possession is to listen to our other episodes that aren't about this topic. So without any further ado, it all starts with some kind of contact with an evil presence, an evil force. And this can take a wide variety of forms. The one that you see most commonly in movies is the use of a Ouija board, or a talking board, or a pendulum, or any kind of spirit communication device. I think something else you see a lot of is cursed objects. Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Just think about the Annabelle franchise, for example where it's a billion-dollar franchise about a cursed doll. Not even only the doll, but the entire building that, I believe, the Warren family was their names. The Perones. Yeah, Yeah. they have the entire building full of cursed objects that they have to keep locked up. Yeah, the Warren Museum. Yeah. Yes. Now, interestingly enough, Lorraine Warren's grandson told me that Lorraine didn't call it a museum. She called it a prison. For all these cursed things. And of course, someone in the group immediately asked him, well, why don't you just destroy these cursed items? Like, that seems like the easiest thing. And he said, you can't destroy a demonic entity. You can't destroy a spirit. But you can contain them in these objects. Because once something is in a doll or could literally be in any object at all, it's not just one specific thing. Like, the can of soda sitting on the desk here could be a cursed item. That can of soda contains 300 milligrams of caffeine, so guess again. It's a terrible curse all its own. It really is. Bang teas don't have carbonation in them. They're, they're dangerous. <laughs> Absolutely dangerous. <laughs> Demonic almost. Go on. So, when the spirit is attached to an item like this, it's, it's stuck in that form until that form gets destroyed. So, what... Chris McKinnell, Lorraine's grandson, said to me was, if you were to burn or destroy that Annabelle doll, whatever spirit is in there is now free to find something else to attach to. And the whole cycle of the haunting can just keep repeating. So that's why they keep all this supposedly extremely dangerous material in their basement. Is it still um, like accessible to the public, do you know? like Do people go in there? I don't know. I know that the ownership has bounced around because, unfortunately, there is a lot of money to be made in any kind of paranormal game, supposedly. That's definitely a promised land I haven't tasted. Um, But people will pay to go in a place like that, and if you have somebody that's unethical, I guess, for lack of a better term, they won't have any problem letting just random strangers in the presence of evil. Whereas someone with a little more uh, scruples wouldn't. So honestly, I don't know who runs that museum now. Yeah, that's kind of crazy to think about that you'd be allowed to go in, especially if those are all cursed objects with all the energy that would be in there, especially the negative energy. We just had um, a guy in here the other day on a local business podcast telling us about his crystal shop that he has. And he said even though he doesn't believe in that kind of stuff so much, a lot of people like refuse to go in because of all the different crystals he has create so much energy. 
Yeah. And it's crazy to think if they can feel the energy like that, it must be it must be extremely negative and such a heavy energy in a place like that with all those cursed objects. I think you touched something very important there. I think the people that really pursue this stuff the most are the people that don't believe in it because they want they either just don't believe in it and it's an easy way to make money or they're looking for proof or they're looking for something and people have said to me before like why doesn't the kps go to haunted houses why don't you guys do seances why don't you do why don't you go looking for ghosts and the short answer is i don't want to put anyone in the team in danger that's the that's the main reason if we're going to go to a haunted location it's going to just be we're hanging out at night somewhere like I'm not going to like try to summon anything or communicate with anything because I think it raises more harm than good. But on the other hand, if I were someone that had no belief in an afterlife or a spirit world or anything like that, I'm sure we would be going into abandoned buildings most weekends, which then gets into the other thing of like if somebody falls through the floor or whatever, that's um, more concerning than most forms of spirit you're going to find in an old building or if you get some kind of disease from it, whatever. Anyway, getting back to the overarching theme here, when you come into contact with some kind of cursed item, you seek a spirit of some kind, or in another case, you invite the spirit into your life directly, which I believe is very powerful and, and actually can happen then it will try to communicate with you. It will try to get you to be curious because any kind of evil, whether it is temptation, whether it is a demon, whether it's even a vampire, which I don't personally believe exists, it needs permission to enter your life. It can't do so on its own. And it's the case with these, these evil spirits. They can tell you things, they can show you things, they can make stuff appear to happen, but they don't ultimately have any power unless you give it to them. So you contact a spirit with a Ouija board. Let's go with the classic textbook example that all of our vast audience has probably heard many times before. You're at a party and you're playing on a board and you talk to a spirit. And it's a five-year-old little boy named Timmy. And Timmy's lost his mother. He's lost his parents. And he's very scared. And the spirit tells you through the board that it needs your help. It needs you to be this guiding figure for it. It needs a friend, is a phrase that has been reported a lot. So you're moved with sympathy by the appearance of this small child spirit who died in an unfortunate way. So you allow it to communicate with you. You talk to it. You give your, something of yourself to it. And eventually you give it some kind of permission to enter into your life. This is when it reveals that it was not a child. It was not a small kid who lost his mom in a fire or anything. It was an evil spirit pretending to be that to get your sympathy. Because when you think about it, if you were an evil spirit or if I were an evil spirit and I wanted to gain access into someone's home, if I appeared to them as a terrifying monster with flame and smoke and horns and stuff, the person would not let me enter into their home. The person would tell me to get lost. But if I came to them as a lost kid, a seductive member of the opposite sex perhaps, or of the same sex, depending, something that was desirable, then that person will let the the spirit in. And this is the first stage, the infestation stage. And if you watch ghost shows, and I don't mean ghost adventures, I mean like older ghost shows before they kind of went down that path, they'll talk about buildings being infested with spirits. And it's the idea that You know, literally a building has a bunch of evil entities in it. Um, The Demon House or the Amityville Horror House, for example, where something terrible happens in this place and that acts as a beacon to these entities. It, It draws them in like moths to a flame. Something like a murder 
is the most obvious one. Some kind of great sexual trauma is a very common one that I've seen personally. Any kind of emotional distress that goes beyond, I'm a college kid, I'm stressed out. Something severe. That kind of energy that is created in those bad situations is food to these evil beings that are attracted to it and come closer to it. And once they're there in your vicinity, they will try to get you to give them permission to enter into your life, to enter into your career, as the case may be. And it's possible to resist these things. I would say that we are able to resist most of these advances because I don't think very many people have ever been afflicted by demons. I think a lot of times people are either just having psychological issues or they're exaggerating or in another case they just want attention. Which I can tell you all there's many better ways to get attention than to claim that you're possessed. Um, could all do a little better than that. But let's say that you do give this spirit, you know, this small child, whatever. You give it permission to be around you, to enter into your home. You enter into what's called the obsession stage, which is the second one on the list. And it's just like what it sounds. It starts to occupy your thoughts. It becomes something that's never far from you. You're constantly thinking about it. You're literally obsessed with this entity and looking for answers. And we see it happen in investigation stories a lot of the times where somebody is looking into a location. They're exploring its history, its sordid past, whatever. And they start to neglect other parts of their life to focus on this. Maybe your marriage starts to take a hit because you're spending all your time researching this spirit or this haunting whatever. You're neglecting your family because all you want to do is read books about it and find out more. You're staying up all night trying to communicate with these beings and it causes you to lose sleep. Your physical health starts to deteriorate. It's all going on in your mind, but it's steadily taking control of you little by little. And that's the important thing to understand about any kind of demonic activity, is that it's very rarely dramatic like it is in a movie. It's a process. It's a slow, steady buildup. Okay. So the person is obsessed. They can't get this thing off their mind. It's all they care about. It's all they want to know about. Their relationships go to shit. Their job goes to shit. They might even quit their job to pursue this more. It reaches a point that they've become totally isolated. And this paves the way for the last two stages, which are the most severe and are the ones that are reported perhaps the most. What essentially happens is this. If you have somebody with a strong support system, they can face all kinds of adversity. Like, I know it's a silly example, but I was watching Yu-Gi-Oh! with a couple of my friends recently. And as long as they have friendship, they can get through anything. And that's really cheesy, but there's a lot of truth in that. When you're on your own, setbacks are much harder to get through. Disappointments are harder to overcome and, and put out of your mind. So what the entity, what the demon, what the wicked spirit, whatever you want to call it, wants to do is separate you from the things that matter to you, mostly your relationships. It wants to create fighting between spouses, fighting between friends, even between parents and children, all of these things. The goal is to make the person alone. The goal is to isolate the person because before you can really start to take a toll on someone, you have to make sure that all of those people that might interfere are out of the picture. And it's really fucked up, and I've tried not to curse as much on these shows, but it's really fucked up because it's the exact same pattern that any kind of abuser does. Um, whether it's a domestic relationship, a drug abuser, anything like this. It follows the same pattern. Anyway, 
the person is alone now. Everybody else has been shut out. They've been driven away by these arguments, by this person's obsession with something that seems ridiculous to anybody that's not going through it. Now the person's alone. And we move to the third stage, which is the oppression stage. This is where physical stuff starts to happen. You wake up in the middle of the night and you feel something pulling on your blankets. Then you start waking up with strange bruises. And you weren't abducted by aliens, so it must be demons. Unless you were abducted by aliens. In which case, contact us. Yes, we want to hear your stories. We want to hear your demon stories too, but aliens seem a little more common. So, you wake up with bruises on your legs. You get the notorious three scratch marks on your back or on your arm or whatever. Some people have reported even bite marks, which is a little beyond. The oppression stage is all about taking a physical toll on someone. It's about doing damage to them. Because what's happened in the obsession stage is that you've broken the person down mentally. You've shaken their trust in their friends and family and vice versa so that you get this person alone and now you can start bullying them physically. You can literally start beating them up. And we see this in movies. Things like furniture moving, dishes flying around. It's exaggerated in movies, but the general idea is that now something in intense is happening and there's not really any going back. But now we get to the really heartbreaking part that is the, the most crippling part of this whole thing. Because of the damage that's been caused in the obsession stage, the oppressed person tries to tell people what's happening to them, and nobody believes them, because it sounds ridiculous. I think I told the story on the last episode of someone who just woke up with a small scratch on her side and told me it was a demon attacking her. Well, of course I don't believe that. That could be literally anything else. And I don't know that person very well. But say I'm a family member of this person going through this whole process. They've spent the last three months where all they do is talk about demons and ghosts and stuff. And then all of a sudden they wake up with these injuries that match all the descriptions in movies and books. What am I going to think as the family member? What desperate plea for attention is this? And that's another one of the hallmarks of any true evil in this world. It can hide itself really well, and it can go undetected. It can be explained as any number of other things, except what it really is. So the person is completely alone now. Their mind has been eaten away at. Their body is under assault. They're not eating. They're not sleeping. Their whole life is kind of spiraling downward. And it's in this final, desperate state that we reach the fourth stage, which is demonic possession, which is, of course, the most famous and the most dramatic. And this is where another spirit, another entity, takes control of a person's body and uses it for whatever purpose. It's important to note with this that a demon can't take the person's soul or anything like that. It's always a physical control. And the reason for this is mysterious. You know, we don't have a good answer of why a demon would want to take a body. But if I had to guess, I would say that you're dealing with a being that is not physical. It is a spiritual, incorporeal entity. It can't accomplish very much. It can't do a lot of harm. But if it has a body to control, then it can cause much more damage. So the person is possessed. They alternate between states of knowing who they are and what they're doing and being under the control of this entity. And I would imagine it's very jarring to be in this kind of scenario where you go to sleep one night and you wake up and you're in a different part of the house with strange marks on you or something like this. And it sounds very similar to schizophrenia and many other mental illnesses, which once again is one of the scary things of these scenarios. If there are a hundred people that claim to be possessed, 
most likely a hundred of them are not possessed. It's very, very, very rare. It's once in a great, great, great while scenario. And it looks so similar to all these other conditions that even when it does come along, the doctors and the experts that talk to this person think, oh, they just have X, Y, and Z condition. And so the evil is able to continue in the guise of being something else. And this is usually the part in the book or the movie when they call in the church and bring in a priest and do this exorcism. So (laughs) the exorcism that you see in a movie is not really accurate at all because the accurate exorcism is not very exciting. It's not very eventful. What you essentially do, at least in, in the Catholic Church, you get a priest and you get the person who's possessed, obviously, and you bring in family members, maybe deacons or other priests, and everybody prays over this possessed person and asks that they be delivered from this evil, this affliction that's happening. And occasionally they sprinkle holy water on the person, and occasionally they will touch them with a cross or a Bible or something like that. And this will go on. They'll do this for an hour or two today, and then they'll go home, and they'll come back the next week and do the same thing. And this can go on for months or even years before there's any change in the person. It's not at all what it is in a movie where The priest comes in, he says a couple things in Latin for five minutes, the demon like sets shit on fire and then it leaves and that's the end. It goes on for a very long time. And the part that nobody likes to talk about is that it's very often not successful. There are many cases where the entity is too strong for the person doing the exorcism and they're not able to remove it. And nobody can really say why that is. You really get into a matter of faith. And in many ways, it is in God's hands. And that's not something a lot of people want to hear. I think immediately of the movie The Possession, which I don't know if you've seen that one. It's the one with the Dybbuk box, where basically the dude's daughter gets possessed and he goes to these rabbis to try to save her. And the lead rabbi says to the guy, it's in God's hands now. And the guy says, if it were your daughter going through this, would you leave it up to God? And that's the mic drop of that movie. The rest of it's not very good. Is that the one where the moths like come out of the box in the, the garage? Yep. Yeah. That's the one. I remember that. With modest Yahoo as the lead character. Yeah. <laughs> so... That seems like a chilling place to stop for today, everybody. Hope you all have an enjoyable week, night, day, whatever it is when you're listening. And it's going to be another two weeks before you hear from us here because we have spring break at Keystone. So be safe, stay scary, and we'll see you next time. Have a good one, guys. See you next time.